What have you got right here, right now? You've got your body sitting here breathing, and you've got your mind that's thinking and aware. So let's see if we can put these things together, see what we can make out of them. You could spend the hour thinking about the day, or last week, or next week. Or you could spend the hour creating a state of concentration. You've got these potentials here, they're coming in from the past. What you've got in terms of the body and the mind have a lot to do with your past actions. But you have choices in the present moment as to what to do with them. So try to bring the mind to the breath in a way that feels good. Notice where you feel the breathing, and whether it's comfortable. If it's not comfortable, you can try changing it in different ways. Do you find something you like? Then try to stick with it, try to maintain that sense of well-being all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out. And think about what you can do with that. One of the best things to do with it is to allow it to spread. So you've got the whole body filled with a sense of well-being. That requires that the mind be very still, but very alert and very aware. Because otherwise our thoughts come in and they take over these potentials and they turn them into something else. So be very careful about what you choose to focus on and what you do with it, with the purpose of getting things to settle down. As the Buddha said, our minds are basically active. We have raw material coming in from the past. But we're not just passive observers of what's coming on. We take those different types of raw materials, and we turn them into various thoughts, various ideas, plans, all kinds of things, what the Buddha calls aggregates. Your sense of your body is something that you do have some choice as to what you're going to focus on in your sense of the body. There's a potential here for heaviness, there's a potential here for lightness, coolness, warmth. potential for energy. You can focus on these things in different ways and make something different out of them. There are potentials for pleasures and pains right now. You could focus on a painful part of the body and make yourself really miserable for the hour. Or you could focus on something pleasant. And depending on how skillful you are, you could even make yourself miserable with that. But if you develop skill, sometimes you can take even unpleasant things from the past, unpleasant potentials from the past, and use them skillfully as part of your meditation. You've got perceptions, the labels you put on things, you've got the intentions that are fabricating these things, and then you've got consciousness, which is aware. Those five things are the aggregates. And as the Buddha said, if we cling to them, we're going to suffer. Particularly if we cling to them with ignorance. If we cling to them with knowledge, there's still going to be some stress, but we can turn them into a path. So the choice is ours. And the reason we have a choice is because, as I said, they come in potential form and then we actualize them. We have some freedom of choice in the present moment as to how we're going to actualize them. And the more alert we are and the more aware we are of what's happening, the more we can actually shape things in a good direction. We'll carefully begin to see that when we cling to things, it's like the Buddha said, we're trying to feed off them. And all that we primarily feed on the, the results of what we get from our fabrication of the present moment, 
We also feed off of the raw materials. We feed off of the process of turning them into something that we like, and we feed off of the anticipation. Even before we get what we want, we have lots of anticipation about what we're going to get. You can compare this with fixing food. You hold on to the, the ingredients. You cling to the way you fix those ingredients. Remember when in France the discussion of ratatouille came up and people got really impassioned about what was not allowed or what was and was not allowed in a ratatouille, depending on which part of southern France you came from. That's one way of clinging to the process of fabricating things. Another way is simply enjoying your skills. When you're a good cook, the cooking in and of itself is fun. Also, there's the anticipation of what you're going to get and the actual final taste. You know, if the ingredients were all good and our skills in cooking were all good and the final product was all good, there wouldn't be that much of a problem. But sometimes we're really unskillful. And how we fashion things, and we don't choose very wisely about what we're going to take as our raw ingredients. If we could shift the analogy a little bit, it's like raising chickens. We raise the chickens, we feed the chickens because we want their eggs. But then we're not very discriminating. Anything that comes out of the chicken, we take. Chicken shit, chicken eggs, whatever. We take that as our raw material. Because we're anticipating what we want out of that food, we're not paying very careful attention about what the raw material is, and sometimes we're not paying careful attention as to how we fashion things. Sometimes the food we get makes us sick. And on top of that, as I've said before, these chickens are the chickens from hell. They come in at night and they peck at your eyes, peck at your ears. In other words, these things that we think are going to give us pleasure come out, can turn around and and bite us. As the Buddha said, it's not simply that we feed off of the aggregates, but the aggregates chew us up. So as we sit here and meditate, we're, we're actually using aggregates, but we're trying to be more careful about what raw ingredients we take and what we do with them. We're trying to change our attitudes as to what we want out of these processes. Because for the most part, we just want whatever fun or entertainment or any kind of pleasure you can conceive of. We'll take that. But as you're focusing on concentration, you say, I want to be really picky. I want to create a state of still mind and use just the ingredients that go into that state. As for other things, just leave them aside. Any thoughts of who did what to you and whether it was right or wrong, or what other people think of you, or whatever thoughts are coming to mind that are not related to the breath right now, you just let them go. Those potentials are there, but you don't touch them. You focus on the potentials that are good. As the mind does settle down and become still. When it's really solid, then you can turn and look at these processes of aggregates. Look at the chickens you're feeding, look at the things coming out of the chickens. And you get more skillful not only in your concentration practice, but also in how you deal with life. As the Buddha said, if you see that you're engaged in anything unskillful, there are five things you want to do with it, or five ways of investigating it to get beyond it. The first is just to see it arise. What are the raw materials that we have that we turn into, say, greed, aversion, and delusion? What are the raw materials that we're holding on to? And by looking at their arising, you catch, catch sight of them before you've made much out of them. And you can begin to see, oh, some things are actually eggs and some things are not eggs. They're chicken shit. That we get a little bit more distance from them and ask us, why would I want to make anything out of that? What would I expect out of that? It's because of our anticipation, as I said, that we're not noticing. So focus instead of the anticipation, focus simply on what's actually arising. 
And then when those things pass away, you want to see them pass away as well. Because even the food that comes from eggs doesn't last all that long. And as for unskillful things, you see them pass away. You begin to realize that they're not as monolithic as you might have thought. Say that lust arises in the mind. It's not one continual state of lust. It comes and it goes, and it comes and it goes. The same with anger. They come and they go. And yet we stitch these things together in our imagination to make them more powerful than they actually are. The anger comes and then it goes. It comes and then it comes again and then you stitch it together and say, oh my gosh, there's a lot of anger. It's lasted all this time. And then it goes. And then it comes back again and you stitch it together again and it makes it bigger and bigger. So you feel compelled. You've got to get it out of your system. The same with lust, the same with greed. But when you can see these things actually passing away, passing away, passing away, you begin to realize they're not building up in your system. They're just coming and going and coming and going. So there's no need to feel like the pressure to give in. So the first two steps, seeing things arising, seeing things passing away. Next step, seeing their allure. Anger comes. Why do you like it? Sometimes simply by looking at it arise, you'll see the mind going for it because of an anticipation. But if you can separate the actual arising from the anticipation, you can ask yourself, why do I tell myself that story about the anger? Or why do I tell myself that story about the lust? Sometimes we hide the allure from ourselves. In other words, we hide the stories that we're creating for ourselves that make us go for these things, which is why it requires good, solid concentration and a lot of alertness to catch exactly why is it when something arises like that you choose to go with this rather than something else. Then you want to see the drawbacks. In this case, with the chickens, of course, you want to see the connection. You're feeding the chickens, and the more you feed them, the more energy they have to come around at night and peck at you. And then you can compare the allure to the drawbacks. This is what you wanted to get out of them. This is what you're actually getting out of them. Is it worth it? The purpose of all this is to give rise to a sense of dispassion. It's a word that nobody likes. It sounds kind of dull and gray, but what it is, it's growing up. You're sobering up. You're seeing what you've been feeding on is not real food. You've been feeding on chicken shit. You thought it was all fancy, like those dishes that they say the Japanese restauranteurs prepared for the Americans after World War II. They put a little bit of shit in the dishes just to get back, but they were able to disguise it with all their, all their seasonings. And a lot of things that you've been going for in terms of the anger and the lust and the greed or fear or whatever, it's just very well seasoned chicken shit. When you can see the drawbacks that that has on you, it's not good for your health. At the same time, the chickens keep coming back and pecking at you. Maybe it's time you just stopped. You'd be better off stopping. Now the mind is willing to stop simply because you've got something better to hold on to in the meantime, i.e. your state of concentration. Because otherwise you're afraid you're going to starve. Once you've got the concentration as your food, even though there is some stress in creating the concentration and keeping it going, this is good food. You've got the best possible chicken eggs there are. And they'll strengthen you to the point where there comes a point when you realize that you don't need to fabricate anything at all, that it would actually be better for the mind to stop fabricating. As you say, even the, the eggs have their drawbacks. At that point, the mind actually can attain the deathless, which is a state that doesn't need to feed.
So this is why we're trying to create a state of concentration right now. It's a means. It's not an end. And it is fabricated, but it's a good fabrication. It's a path. It's a path that takes you something, someplace beyond it. You can have done with the chickens altogether, because you don't have any need for them. That's why this is a good skill to master. If you're going to be a, a cook of fabrications, this is the best dish you can do.